uh, good to be back at Berkeley. This is where I was an undergrad. And so this is where I came of age. Uh, and so any immaturity you see is the fault of this university. And let me start uh, with a description of this organism, uh, C. elegans, that uh, many of us work on. There's a few thousand people in the world who do research on this. And uh, it attracted a, a great cohort of people from about uh, the early 70s through to today. Uh, and one of the reasons I think it attracted uh, really uh, great people to work on it was the description of development of this animal was more digital seeming uh, than the description of development that you learn about in developmental biology textbooks, which is, you know, sort of this is muscle and it gets induced when it gets next to uh, epidermal cells, that sort of thing. And this was a, a description of, of a lineage of uh, divisions starting from a single cell it would divide once. This is embryogenesis, sort of 12 hours. And then some of these cells are blast cells that would go on to divide, uh, generating an adult animal over the next three days. And that uh, rather digital description of developmental decisions uh, made many of us think <clears throat> that it would, it would uh, sort of be like, almost like a computational program on how development would be programmed and that we could do the genetics of that by sort of uh, changing the steps of this program. And I think it, it, it attracted um, faux mathematicians to uh, developmental biology, and I count myself as a faux uh, mathematician. And, and many of the people thought in those terms. And so the way we wanted to address this was by doing genetic analysis of this worm and getting mutants uh, that would do development improperly. And this whole enterprise of developmental genetics uh, was um, you know, jumping into the deep end of a pool of, of a very rich intellectual tr tradition that evolved early in my career of, of superb fly geneticists and yeast geneticists and worm geneticists uh, meeting with each other and uh, uh, perturbing developmental systems in really interesting ways. And it was a, a, a fantastic cauldron of discovery that took place in the early 80s uh, for about 20 year period. And the developmental biology Gordon conferences and things like that were, were an amazing education. And our part in that, uh, in the worm community, one aspect of it was these heterochronic mutants, which were mutants uh, isolated by Victor Ambrose and Bob Horvitz. Uh, that cause cell lineage changes. If you watch the division, this is looking at a larval stage one animal. And these are the blast cells along the skin of the animal that will go on to divide as, uh, uh, as time progresses. And in a wild type animal, they'll do this pattern of divisions at larval stage one, two, three, four, adult. Uh, and in these uh, LIN14 or LIN4 mutants, we could see that the lineage was changed. So for example, what would normally take place in an L2 stage <clears throat> would move one stage earlier in a LIN14 null, or uh, this pattern of divisions that would normally take place only in the L1 stage could get reiterated at multiple stages if you were either missing LIN4 or had an opposite kind of allele of LIN14 that was an activating mutation. And so, from this pattern of, of uh, changes in, in cell lineage, and again, this is using the lineage as a kind of a phenotype, uh, using the fact that you can describe development in that kind of precise detail. This opposite of uh, gain of function mutants having the opposite phenotype of loss of function and having a loss of function that mimicked a gain of function made us confident that we had our hands on some of the developmental switches that take place to control this one aspect of lineage. Now, this is not to say we're talking about the entire lineage, right? We're talking about very particular subparts of this lineage. But again, it's a computer programmer kind of view that if you want understand one subroutine, it might inform the larger set of subroutines. And so what are, what are the, the molecular flesh of this um, genetic uh, uh, construct, right? This is all pure genetics, we just, we learn about these things from getting mutants, 
They're, they get named as genes by mapping them onto chromosomes and doing complementation tests. It's old style Mendelian genetics where you say this is a, a lesion that changes something. I wonder what it might encode. And so to figure that out, we had to uh, do the mapping of where these genes were and, and, and sort of precisely figure out the molecular details. And here <clears throat> we were really um, lucky that the, um, John Solston, the same uh, heroic figure uh, that did this lineage, uh, got interested in genomics uh, just in time for the rest of us to not have to do genomics. And so he started putting together maps of yeast artificial chromosomes and cosmids and big chunks of DNA so that we had a physical map of the worm genome and we could hone in on what the gene was. And, and by sort of doing uh, rather classical genetic mapping with restriction fragment length polymorphisms, we could hone in on what the gene was. And the first hint of what we were working on uh, was that in the LIN14 gene, uh, these gain-of-function mutations, the activating mutations that made the gene more active than a wild-type gene, uh, were deletions in the 3 prime untranslated region or a, a translocation that would sort of completely lop off that 3 prime untranslated region. So that said, there's some kind of off switch uh, <clears throat> or, or, or vernier dial that's turning down the juice on this gene. And if you miss that, uh, the gene becomes hyperactive. Uh, the second hint in what was going on was uh, from uh, Victor Ambrose's lab where Candy Lee and Rosalind uh, Feinbaum um, figured out that the LIN4 gene uh, encodes a very tiny RNA. So this is showing that uh, the RNA in the gray box is the mature 22 nucleotide RNA, and this is the precursor of that RNA. And this RNA builds up over time, and that acts as a switch gene and uh, what Victor and I figured out was that if you take the sequence of the LIN4 RNA, shown on this bottom strand here, and try to match it up with the LIN14, three prime untranslated region, you could see these multiple regions where the LIN4 RNA on the bottom could base pair rather imperfectly, as you can see, to, for example, region one, or this is showing region two, or this is showing region three. There were seven sites in the three prime untranslated region, and these sites <clears throat> were deleted, uh, many of them, in a weak gain of function allele, or completely gone in a uh, stronger gain of function allele. In addition, uh, these regions where the, we could see the base pairing, as well as other regions that we still couldn't, still cannot explain, uh, we could see conservation. So the gray bars sh show areas where when you compare this genome sequence to the genome sequence of other nematodes, you could see that these um, uh, RNA segments were under some kind of selective constraint over evolutionary time that would correspond to something like 50 million years. And uh, making an antibody to the LIN14 protein, we could see that the protein product of this gene <clears throat> is expressed at a high level at the early stage, and that specifies that pattern of division that we see at the L1 stage. And then it would go to a much lower level uh, at the next stage. In a, in a gain of function mutant, that switching off would not occur. Now, when we look at a heterozygote between this gain of function mutant and wild type, so this is a, a deletion over plus, what we can see on a northern blot, these are different size messages because one has a six, uh, 600 base deletion, is they have the same abundance at the larval stage uh, one, and they also have a very similar abundance at larval stage four. So it's not the mRNA that's getting decreased, it's the translation of that mRNA. And so the microRNA is affecting translation. So what this showed was that these, these microRNAs can regulate the production of a protein product uh, without causing RNA degradation. And that was the mechanism by which uh, this microRNA regulates its target. The second sort of uh, uh, jump in the, uh, the tiny RNA or microRNA um, rebellion uh, was doing the genetics of this system. So LIN4, we knew, was a negative regulator of LIN14. <clears throat> and we could take a LIN14 allele and ask for, genetically, what are the mutants that could suppress that to get at the other players in the pathway. And out of that, 
uh, came a gene called LET7, which had already been identified in, in a null allele as a lethal. LET stands for lethal. Uh, and that strain uh, died of a, of a lethal bursting of, from its, basically from its um, uh, sexual apparatus. It would sort of blow out uh, from there. And we could that, but we could figure out uh, if, are there suppressors of that? And out of that came LIN41. So we could suppress the lethality of LET7 and get mutations in LIN41. And when we pulled out LET7, it turned out to be another microRNA, completely non-homologous to the first one. And this is the sequence of it, and this is the mutation that was the temperature-sensitive allele uh, of LET7. And it's also temporally regulated. So this LET7 microRNA is not on early in development. It comes on at a later period, um, specifying a, a transition during development, again, in time. Now, in the LET7 case, uh, when we took the, the sequence of LET7 and just did a simple blast analysis uh, to other organisms, we could see that this was perfectly conserved uh, across evolution. And, I, and I'm ashamed to say that this, uh, we figured this out uh, when I was writing a grant. And I was, I was saying in the grant, I'm at home, and I'm saying, oh, well, well, you know, we're going to look for a human homologue of LET7. And as I'm, and this is in the days of modems. And I said, well, yeah, I'll do a, a blast. So I paste it into a blast server. And, you know, 10 seconds later, this comes out. So that was incredibly easy to do, right? The, and this is the key to, of genomics, I think, in the modern age, is that, is that to actually look for LET7 homologs by making it radioactive and screening libraries, you know, I would have never had the oomph to do that. But to just paste it into a blast server, no problemo. Uh, and, and so that said that this is a conserved, uh, uh, and that microRNAs are not just in the province of these little worms. And, and it, it, this is kind of important because I showed you that lineage, which is a weird wormism, right? The, the fact that worms use lineage to control development is not something that applies to everything else. And so in the developmental biology community, Worms were always considered slightly an outlier, and these guys, are, they, they chirp in their own little language about lineage. Uh, now, in the RNA world, the people who think about ribosomal RNAs and messenger RNAs and splicing, uh, those characters were, per they, first of all, they don't know any biology. So they, they were perfectly happy to say, well, what you're finding in, in C. elegans must be universal, because everything's universal. And so, uh, we were not sort of a, a, an outsider group. So th this was important to us in the developmental biology community to say something that does timing control and development might be universal. And it regulates its target genes uh, by base pairing to, the, uh, to this LIN41 very much in the same way. Again, not perfect base pairing. And that imperfect base pairing really mediates the translational control as opposed to RNA degradation. Now, moving into the, the uh, more recent era with genomics and deep sequencing of, of uh, tiny RNAs, we now know that how many uh, microRNAs there are in various organisms, and there's thousands, about a third of which are conserved very, very broadly. The animal clade of organisms has a very common set of microRNAs. Plants have their own set of microRNAs that are not uh, ancestrally related in the sense that the common ancestor of animals and plants probably didn't have a microRNA per se. It probably had siRNAs. Now, one last thing I wanted to mention is, okay, the, the microRNAs are sort of the first example of a tiny RNA, uh, uh, and then what uh, followed was the discovery of RNAi by Fire and Mello and the discovery of siRNAs that are, that are produced from RNAi uh, by David Balcom. And those siRNAs were also 22 nucleotides long. And uh, what was interesting to me uh, was that 22 is actually a, a, a holy number in the Jewish Kabbalah. Uh, and I would bring people into my office. This is, again, my Berkeley background coming back. Uh, with astrology, you know, numerology. And uh, you, you could go to websites that would have uh, uh, New Age music that goes with these Kabbalistic <laughs> trees. That wasn't very helpful in figuring out uh, how this works. What, what was helpful uh, 
was that the first enzymes that were involved with RNAr, the dicer uh, RNAs that cleaves uh, uh, the, the, the long double-stranded RNAs into 22 nucleotides, uh, that had been discovered. And the first RNAi defective uh, mutants with their peewee PAS proteins, a, a particular kind of protein that binds to R, uh, uh, 22 nucleotides, have been discovered, and we tested whether members of, of these gene families were involved in how LET7 might work. And so we could feed uh, the worm, and this is the, one of the magic things about RNAi is that you can actually inactivate genes by feeding. So we could give the worm double-stranded RNA corresponding to all the members of these families and ask, what does it do to the LIN4 or the LET7 RNA? And this is the mature RNA, and these are the um, uh, the, the unprocessed RNAs when you are missing these peewee PAS proteins or dicer. And so that showed that these two pathways use the same mechanism for making these 22 nucleotide RNAs. So doing a large scale screen for uh, components of RNAi, uh, we could use RNAi to go through, and I just wanted to mention uh, that we get a lot of candidates out of these screens, so we can ask for, by feeding RNAi, who give phenotypes that look a lot like the LET7 phenotype, the bursting from the abdomen, and then we can do secondary screens whether they have defects in developmental timing. And this, what this does is generate a lot of ideas, and I just wanted to put up a Linus Pauling quote, which I really love, is, uh, you know, good ideas don't come by just having, a, you know, one or two. You really have to have a lot of ideas, and, and, and many of your ideas should be bad, according to this, right? It's not that all your ideas are going to be good. So when we do these RNAi screens, we have a lot of ideas uh, that come out of them. And here's one that might be good or it might be bad, uh, and that is one of the hits out of this screen is the mevalonate pathway. So these are uh, a gene inactivation that's a lot like taking a statin drug. And if you give worms statin drugs, they have the same defect as we do with microRNAs. And it really suggests the idea that one of the molecular pathways by which statins might work to be therapeutic uh, for coronary artery disease, for example, is regulating microRNAs. And consistent with that as an idea uh, is, is that um, there are knockouts that Eric Olson has made of microRNAs called MIR-206 in a mouse that really makes them resistant to fibrosis of the heart. Uh, where a normal uh, mouse, for example, would have that. So I just, that's what we've been doing. Happy to take any questions.